All right, folks, this is Chuck. It is in Selects time, March 11th, 2014. And that's what we're throwing back to today because I picked out how skateboarding works. Boy, this is a great one. This is uh, sort of vintage stuff you should know all about skateboarding, full of stories about our own skateboarding adventures uh, as young posers that we both were. And uh, it's good stuff. We talk about the history. We talk all about, and you know, of course, it's about a thing that some people are experts in. So we get a lot wrong. But we get it mostly right, and it was a good episode. So please do enjoy how skateboards work right now. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and Charles W. Chuck Bryant's with me. So this is Stuff You Should Know. And Jerry, of course, is here, who just celebrated a birthday. Yeah, happy birthday, Jerry. In, uh, we're Valentine's in our, Day. We're in our Indian sweat lodge that we call a recording booth. Yeah. Man, it's hot. Uh, yeah. Part of it's this thing. You want to turn this off? Because this it really does put out a, a tremendous amount of heat. Yeah, Josh, we have a lamp on our table that we used to see. Well, we can't see any longer. Oh, well. Flying blind. Yeah. <sighs> that did make it like 3% cooler immediately. Yeah. It's that lamp. It's the lamp and then, like, you know, just people generating heat in here. Yeah, podcasters were a uh, balmy bunch. And plus, there's a herd of oxen in the corner. And that doesn't help. No. This has been the best intro ever, I think. You think so? <laughs> I think so. You're not being facetious? No. You, you know the word facetious? What do you got for me? Well, when I was younger, <laughs> uh-huh. I knew the word facetious. It was a word that my dad used a lot. Uh-huh. So I used it in, like, regular conversation. Correctly? Yeah. Okay. But I'd never seen it written out, or so I thought. And then finally one day I ran across in a book, again, this word I kept coming up on, and I was like, what is that word? Facetious. Facetious. And I was like, that's facetious. I don't know that I've seen it spelled either. Yeah, it looks like facet. Facetious? No, it looks like facet, like a facet of a a, a jewel or something. Uh Uh-huh. And then E-S, I-O-U-S. Yeah, there's no way I would have so bombed the spelling of that. Right, but the thing is, it's like I was using it correctly in conversation, and I had seen it in books. I just never put the two together until finally one day it clicked. And you had to get your tattoo changed. (laughs) It's facetious across the back of your neck. Yeah, in in a heart. (laughs) That's right. All right. So um, skateboarding. (laughs) Yeah, about the same time that I realized the word facetious, what it was correctly spelled as. Yeah. I was skateboarding at the time, so that's how it ties in. Gotcha. I was a little skateboarder for a long time. Yeah, I was too. I um, did not, I'm not old enough to where I saw all the different waves of skateboarding of the four, but... You um, you saw the first two? I saw, I didn't (laughs) see the first one. (laughs) That's pretty funny. That would mean I'm dead. (laughs) Um, No, there's plenty of old boarders out there. Sure. Yeah. But I was of the age where I definitely had the um, small sort of uh, plastic board with the single oh, wow, yeah. little tail on the back only uh-huh. and clay wheels. No. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. Clay wheels, it seems to me like that. Those the skateboards from, from biblical times had clay <laughs> wheels. That's what I think of when I see yeah. clay wheels. What do they even look like? Uh, just brown, you Are, know. Were they super dangerous? Well, yeah, and and if you've seen the great documentary, um, Dogtown and Z Boys, uh-huh. they go over. It's a really good doc, by the way. Yeah, like amazing footage that they have, and good music, and highly recommended over the movie version, The Lords of Dogtown. Was Val Kilmer in that? No, Heath Ledger was. Ah, uh. he played the. Uh, the mentor, I can't remember his name. Of Skip. The, the Zephyr crew. Yeah, Skip. Skip. Skip yeah. went on to found Santa Monica Airlines skateboards. Oh, yeah? Yeah. He he was he stayed on as like a big influence in skateboarding. Oh, well, that's good. So oh, anyway, I, Skip. I just wanted to point out that I have branched a few different, like I started out with a little clay one, and then in high school <laughs> is when I got crazy. the big, huge, fat skateboard when they were super obnoxious. Yeah, that's, see, that's when I came into skating. Yeah. 1983, 84. Yeah. Had like a nice Lance Mountain. Um, it wasn't my first board. My first board, remember the Nash Tough Tops? No. There was, it was blank on the bottom. There were no graphics. But on the top, yeah. cut out in the grip tape, was like a, a star that looked kind of like a, a saw blade, yeah. a circular saw blade. And then the the big 
difference was the different colors of the board underneath. So yeah. there's blue or pink or yellow or whatever. Mine was like neon green. Yeah, your big fat one? Yeah, and yeah. looking back, like kind of corny. And I think after that is when like True Skater started being like, you know, we don't really care that much about like awesome graphics. Like we just want a, a good board. Good board? You wanted some uh, rib bones on the side? You remember those? Underneath, yeah, yeah, but I don't think people like those now either. Oh no, not anymore. Like real skaters. No, that that the whole the point of those. I think it was, you know, to let you rail slide or whatever a yeah. lot easier. But I think it was also to protect those graphics too. It totally was because I had a little big plastic uh, bumper under the tailpiece too, mm-hmm. which is counterintuitive to the tail doing bone. the tricks. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, who cares about protecting the the tail? It's weird. Yeah, there I was, was also a nose bone too. I was not never very good. Oh, I wasn't either. I don't yeah. mean to give that. <laughs> okay. I mean, I spent a lot of hours skating, and yeah. I never got very good. I think I pulled off one kickflip once. Really? Once. That's good. I thought it was pretty good too. That is the trick that you most often see kids not landing, just right? Driving down the street. Yeah. If you ever see a kid, like, I rarely see a successful kickflip just on the sidewalk. Oh yeah. If you see somebody who pulls off a kickflip, the chances are there's somebody filming them. Right. <laughs> because they know that they're going to be able to pull off the kickflip. In L.A., actually, I would see more, you know, obviously better skaters out there. Sure. Or uh, New York. Land. Yeah, true. All right. So Skateboarding. Should we get going with a little history? Yeah, let's talk about the history of this. I, uh, this this is so close to my heart, man. I fell down the rabbit hole today watching, like, old skate videos yeah. and, like, checking out old Powell Peralta boards. That was my totally. jam was Powell. Well, we mentioned that there have been four distinct waves of skateboarding starting in uh, 1959. Yeah. And each new wave, like it's it's just waned in popularity here and there and then come back strong and stronger due to either uh, advances mainly in like skateboard technology. Right. right. And And, trickery. Yes. And um, parental acceptance. Yeah, for sure. Because it never really goes away. Skateboarding is either... Ever since its inception, it's either been mainstream or else forced underground and like practiced by juvenile delinquents who kind of kept it going and advanced yeah. it quietly until it came back into the mainstream and parents were like, oh, okay, totally. you guys can skate again. Yeah. But the, the true origin of the skateboard, the first one that came out, the first commercially produced one was in 1959. It's called the Roller Derby Skate. Yeah, and before that, you know, if you've seen the movie Back to the Future when mm-hmm. Marty McFly rips the little milk crate off the front of the right. the homemade wooden scooter, yeah. that was where skateboards really came from. You just, you know, it was a sort of a homemade deal with like a peach crate right. as, as the front of your scooter. A couple of handles. Yeah, steel wheels from roller skates. Yeah, and that was... super dangerous. Right, but it, like you say, if you take the peach crate off and take the handles off, you have that 2 by 4 with the roller skate wheels. Yeah. And they don't know exactly who did it. They think actually several people probably did it simultaneously. Marty McFly. In the, right. Yeah. In the 40s. They think surfers in California did it. There are kids in France that were seen doing it in the 40s. So oh, yeah? It kind of spread. It happened. It arose independently around the world at about the same time. That's called the zeitgeist. That is, my friend. So now we're in the 19, early 1960s, and it was, I mean, it really took off like a rocket yeah. in the first few years of the, of the 1960s. Like uh, 50 million skateboards were sold in those first three years. <laughs> it's so crazy. And it was everywhere. Yeah. It was like the hot new craze. Well, it was like also like hula hoops and things sure. like that. Like it was, America was in a crazy mood. A craze mood, yeah. Right. Like whatever the big thing was. Yeah, and skateboards fell into that big time. The problem is uh, they were pretty dangerous. Yeah. There wasn't a lot you could do with them. No. They, because, again, they're steel wheels. They're, it's basically a two-by-four on steel wheels. Yeah, you could um, ride down the street and you could fall off of it. Exactly. <laughs> that was, that the, was the extent of it. Yeah. So, it, it, And I think because of the safety concerns, overnight skateboarding just went away. In like 1965, it was over. Yeah, but it still kind of stayed somewhat popular as a uh, thing to do among surfers when the waves weren't breaking. Right, um, they would just kind of sidewalk surf, is what they called it, and they never really saw it as anything bigger than a, a supplement to surfing. Right, it was just kind of like it, it wasn't its own thing. Right, until. Uh, the 60s, the late 60s, or the early 70s, when clay wheels came about, you could do a little more stuff, I think. Well, clay was 
better than the steel wheels, right? But still bad, right? Like and that's if you when, hit a rock in the road, you're toast. And like that's when people started dying from skateboards, yeah, which kind of led to its decline again. Sure. And then some surfers, the Zephyr crew, are the ones who like broke skateboarding out once and for all. Well, yeah, thanks to uh, Frank Nassworthy's invention of the urethane wheel in 1972. Yeah. Uh, he founded Cadillac Wheels, and all of a sudden it was like a smooth, like steady, silent experience on a skateboard for the first time. Right. And that I mean, you changed everything. It did because yeah. it could grip. Um, it wasn't just that it wasn't rumbly any longer. Yeah. It, like the urethane could grip like concrete or it um, could go over asphalt a pebble or pavement. Yeah. Instead of just stopping. Exactly. Yeah. And um, yeah, all of a sudden there were way more surfaces that could be skated. And that plus the invention of the truck. Yeah. Which is basically an axle for your wheels that not only allows the wheels to revolve more smoothly, especially when you add a set of bearings, yeah. but it also allows you to maneuver to the left or the right, which is a big deal. Yeah. It kind of opens things up. They're twisty. Yeah. And then the uh, kicktail also changed everything. All yeah. these kind of came together at about the same time. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned the Zephyr crew in 1975 that held the first... Um, uh, basically competition in Del Mar, California. Mm -hmm. And that's when, and if you've seen the documentary, it's pretty great. I mean, they had sort of the holdovers from the 60s doing like handstands and all these sort of right. square antiquated moves. Right. And then these little punks came in there and just like tore the place up and like the judges didn't even know how to judge them at the time because right. they had never seen anything like it. Yeah. It was and pretty cool. It was a pool. They were skating in pools, right? Or a well, bowl at least? Yeah, the pool thing came a little later because they... um there was a big drought in the mid '70s mm -hmm. in Southern California, and water was actually in short supply. So people would drain their pools or not refill them or whatever for the right. new summer. Right. And so they started busting into backyards and skating in pools. Yeah, and they would bring their own pumps and hoses to, to yeah. drain like all the <laughs> muck out entirely. Yeah. And then just like skate that pool. And there was um, at one of those pools. A kid named Tony Alva, who was in that Zephyr crew, it was Tony Alva, Jay Adams, and Stacy Peralta. Yeah, among uh, others, yeah. Right, but those were like the big three. Tony Alva's your guy, right? Stacy Peralta. Oh, I thought you were like a huge Tony Alva dude. Huh. Oh, okay. No, and I I respect. Oh, sure. For Tony Alva, but no, I was always Pal Peralta. Okay. Um, but Tony Alva, uh, at one of those pools, kept going and going and pushing himself harder and harder, and then one day. He cleared the coping of the pool. Yeah. And like caught air. Yeah, with his hand at first. Oh, he did like a hand plant? Yeah, that was how that originally came about. But he did leave contact with the pool. Right, and no one had ever done that before. And everyone's like, whoa. And that was like the creation of vert style skateboarding. Yeah. Um, and Alva went on at like age 19 to found his own skateboarding company. Yeah. He was the first one to use um, Canadian maple veneers, which we'll talk about. Um, and it was a like really innovative, sure. especially for a 19 year old skate punk from Southern California. Yeah, they all were. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Like this collection of kids was were, and most of them ended up being like very savvy, like wealthy businessmen later right. on. <laughs> yeah, and and right after the Del Mar competition, the Zephyr crew kind of scattered to the wind and went. And, and found purchase yeah. and, cre and expanded skateboarding as a sport and as a theme. And one of the things that they brought with them from having been part of a crew is to form their own crews um, of people that they sponsored, which made those people pros. Right. And those pros would go on tour. Yeah. And when those pros went on tour, they were skating, say, Powell and Peralta skateboards and showing local kids what could be done with a skateboard. Yeah. And those kids would go buy Powell Peralta skateboards and go out and skate. And the, it, it that whole idea of doing demos on tour yeah. with pros who are sponsored by skateboarding companies really helped expand skateboarding in the 80s and, and created that third wave where skateboarding just became it. Yeah, I mean, it was big in California and Florida. Like, my cousins were way into it in Florida early mm -hmm. on. But it really took off when kids like me in Georgia and you in Ohio yeah. were skiing, you know, skiing, uh, skating up my, like, steep driveway and right. trying to do little 180 turns going back down like it was a wave. <laughs> right. And I was, you know, I was one of those silly little kids. Yeah. That, like, was so caught up in it at first. Well, I had a kid who uh, lived across the tracks from me who had a half pipe, like a 
good half pipe that his dad yeah. built him. Um, and that was part of that rise in 1983, I think, that third wave. Yeah. Where, um, because I should say, we didn't really mention, um, in the late 70s after Alva Skateboards was founded and, and Pal Peralta was founded and all that, um, skateboarding took a hit mainstream-wise. Yeah. And it became associated with punks and, like, just, th- like, like just punk kids. Bad kids, yeah. Yeah, the bad kids and who, who literally gave skateboarding a bad name. Yeah. Um, and so it was kind of driven underground again. And then in the early 80s, it experienced another rise. And its image kind of changed a little bit thanks to the Powell Peralta team, the Bones Brigade. Yeah. Who were actually like, they were all young kids and they were skateboarders and all they cared about was skating. But they were also like kind of clean cut. As far as um, the, as far as skateboarders went, and, like they didn't do drugs. At least they didn't publicly do drugs. Yeah, Stacy Peralta was a good kid. Yeah, um, and so the the kids that he sponsored, like Tony Hawk, Mike McGill, Steve Caballero, Christian Hasoy, yeah. all of those kids were good kids too, and they had a tremendous amount of influence on the the, the skaters who were into them. Yeah, and so it kind of changed skating's image a little bit too. It went from like being something that, like punk kids were into to something all kids were into yeah it um it did go into another four-year lull toward the end of the 70s before it started coming back in the mid 80s and bmx had a lot to do with it oh yeah that became more popular and um you know some skateboarder magazine shut down or changed names to a different you know title and it just like you said it never went away to the adherence of like like the true underground skateboarders. Right. It's always, there's always somebody who's been skating yeah. at some point ever since 1959. But in the mid 80s is when it definitely came back uh, to the, the big time mainstream. Yeah. And I can't tell if it's just nostalgia on my part or else if that was when it like really exploded. But like no, that, that's was, when it, that was my wheelhouse. No, remember the videos, man? Oh, the yeah. Bones Brigade videos? Yeah. And that was another thing, too. The, one of the reasons why um, skateboarding was able to spread as a sport or a recreation or whatever. Um, was in part the access to cheap VHS players. Yeah. Because the Bones Brigade made videos and people bought them. Like you could go to your local skate shop and buy like a Bones Brigade VHS tape for like 25 or 30 bucks. You kind of had to if you wanted to learn the cool tricks. Right. That's like the only place you could see them at the time. Yeah. And then they were produced in a way like you'd want to watch them again and again. Like I think the oh, fourth yeah. one, the Search for Animal Chin, actually had like a plot and everything. Oh, really? And, yeah. Interesting. So uh, you would watch these things again and again. These guys became like your heroes. And not only were you watching them do their tricks and, and you know, watching their videos, yeah. but like you also wore their T-shirts. And oh, yeah. Like you got their deck. And it said a lot. Like I had a Mike McGill deck. I really was into Mike McGill. Yeah. I had a Lance Mountain deck, was really into Lance Mountain. And I like Tony Hawk and everything, but I never had a Tony Hawk deck. Like, you identify with a skater based on your personality type. Yeah, and your style. Yeah. Style had a lot to do with it, for sure. Sure. Uh, Then there was another lull in the uh, early 90s because um, of the recession is what everyone seems to blame it on. And (laughs) I know. I know. I thought it was weird. I don't remember that happening, but now that I think back, Late high school, early college, there, there wasn't a lot of like skate stuff going on in no. my world. And I wasn't skating at the time, but I was still just young enough to pick up on that fourth wave in the early mid '90s. Well, thanks to the X Games, mm-hmm. that's what really brought it back big time. And Tony Hawk too. Yeah, he kept it going. His uh, video games definitely helped spread that fourth wave too. Um, and it, it, I guess it's never really gone away. No, it, it's bigger than ever. Skating? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, another thing I think that helped is that 80s nostalgia craze. Yeah. You know, that how the 80s inform everything today. Part of that was that the, I guess, re-exploring that third wave of um, skateboarding. So, like, if you go right, into right. a band store, they're all, like, old Powell decks or old, like... Um, Vision Street, Vision Streetwear decks. Remember oh, the screaming Vision hand? Streetwear, yeah, yeah, and slime balls. Yeah, I have, and I still have a pair of Vans, uh, old schools. The black always, and white checker. Uh, no, no, no. Those were the. I can't remember the name of those. The slip-ons. Yeah. The old schools are the black. They had the low top and the high top. Uh huh. That has the little sort of white wave on the side. Oh yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I still wear those shoes. Yeah.
So, Chuck, uh, we're going to talk about the skateboard itself you promised. Yes. Um, there are three main parts. You have the deck, you have the trucks, and you have the wheels. Yeah. And like we said, the, the trucks connect the wheels to the deck, and they serve as the, the axles on the front and the back. Uh-huh. It's a little T-shaped thing. Right. Um, and I remember definitely, like, taking a lot of time to get your trucks the way you wanted. Oh, yeah. Some people liked them really loose. Yeah, I didn't. And some people liked them a little tighter. If they're looser, you can turn uh, more aggressively. Yeah, but you also get wobble wheel if you, you get, get going too fast. wobble wheel. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I liked mine a little tighter, too. Yeah. Like, you want to be able to turn, but you also, I like the stability of a tighter truck. Yeah. Um, you've also got your wheels, which have a set of bearings. Yeah, and the wheels haven't changed too much. No. They're still polyurethane. Yeah. They've changed in size a little bit, but it's the same basic concept. Right. And, it, again, it still depends on your preference. Like, you can buy a pre-made skateboard that's all put together, mm-hmm. but as you know, any skater worth his salt buys the deck, right. buys the trucks, right. buys the wheels yeah. that they want, puts it all together. You might as well just go to, like, a, a department store and buy your skateboard <laughs> if you're just going to buy it all together. Yeah, with a little outfit that comes with it, <laughs> like <laughs> right. your Skater 101 outfit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the last part, arguably the mo- most important part, well, one of three most important parts is the deck. <laughs> yeah. And the deck uh, has evolved over time. We talked about how the tail kicked up uh, in the early 70s. And yeah, that just allowed, in the rear. Yeah, that allowed first. a lot of, like, tricks. Yeah. Um, and the if you look at a skateboard from the top or the bottom where you're looking at the outline, that's called the plan. Yeah. And then if you look at how the tail or the nose is kicked up and then the concave to the interior of the skateboard which allows more control and stability yeah um that's called the concave so you've got the plan and the concave yes and those are uh part of the deck right they inform the shape and size of the deck and um then on top of that deck you have the grip tape which i i thought that that would have been a recent innovation apparently grip tape was invented all the way back in 1948 for scooters oh really yeah they yeah. needed it back then and a guy named uh Ferdinand Switzhofer uh, invented it. Nice. Yeah. And they changed the name from Switzhofer tape to grip tape. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and in the 80s too, the the thing now is your whole board is covered with grip tape. In the in mid-80s, I remember I just had like, there were graphics on top, so you right. just had tape at the front and the back. Yeah. And it really didn't make any sense. Like, you, the whole thing should be grippy. Yeah, but I mean... Like, again, the Powell graphics were pretty awesome. Yeah. Steve Caballero had that <laughs> dragon, or, like, at least you had the Bones guy. Uh, the decks are not a solid piece of wood. It's actually uh, thin layers um, of veneer, and they are laminated, and then you spread adhesive, and you just, you know, like with a lot of furniture, it's just many layers of thin wood mm-hmm. compressed together into a mold, and it's a hydraulic press that just smashes it all together until you've got your a really solid piece of wood. Yeah, and it's definitely a lot stronger than just the sum of its parts. Yeah, for sure. From being molded plywood. Um, and then you cut that plan out. Yeah. Uh, and then after that, you uh, spray it with some sealant because you don't want to accidentally ollie into a puddle or a fountain or something like that and have <laughs> your board warp. Or purposefully right. ollie into a fountain. And then the graphics are put on, and then the grip tape. I get a sense that graphics aren't like super cool anymore. Am I wrong? That it's sort of a I like think it's a matter back of to basics thing. I think it's a matter of preference. It definitely isn't like in the mid '80s. It was like they were so obnoxious. With oh the yeah, remember the Gator one? Mm, no, it was like um, kind of like a, I guess a Vertigo thing, but it was made out of different spikes. You would recognize it immediately really? if you saw it. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely had the stickers on my car, and like it was a thing. <laughs> we had a shop in Stone Mountain called Surfs Up. <laughs> uh-huh. In Stone Mountain, Surf Stone Mountain. Yeah, that was obviously open for like you know four and a half years, right? And they had like skate gear and surfer gear, and yeah. for all us like you know in in inland living people. Yeah, it was who funny. thought they were cool. Like you used to have to it, initially at that early wave in the early '80s, like you had to go to like a ski shop. Because yeah. skiing was already established, and then yep. like they'd open up a little section for skateboards. Totally. And then eventually it got a little bigger, and then all of a sudden there were actual skate shops. Yeah. All right, so that is the actual uh, skateboard in all its three parts. Right. Um, and I guess we need to talk about how to ride this thing. Um, yeah, because the fourth part is you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, 
Although it looks cool just hanging on your wall. Yeah. If you want to impress the ladies. Sure, like check out my skateboard. Yeah, I was all into that. Um, but it is like surfing, and the reason they compare it to surfing is that it's sort of just like a smaller version. You have the side stance, just mm-hmm. like on a surfboard. Right. And if you heard our surfing podcast, you heard us talk about regular foot and goofy foot. Is there a mongo foot on surfing too? No, because you're not pushing off of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, regular foot is your left foot forward. Yeah. And uh, you're using your right foot to push. Goofy foot is the opposite of that. Your right foot forwards, so you're pushing with your left. Which does not feel right. No. And I was a manga foot, and I never knew it until I looked this up. Yeah. Um, that is when your left foot is forward. I'm sorry, your, your right foot is on the board, but you're using your left foot to push. And, and your foot is at the rear, not the front. Yeah. So and I, I just, that just feels supernatural to me. Does it? But um, not supernatural, but <laughs> right. very natural. There's ghosts in my feet. <laughs> But um, apparently, Mongo Foot is, is, I think you're sort of frowned upon as a person by, you know, though, by real skaters if it you're Mongo Foot. just be like, lay off. I've watched you. You can't even kick flip. So you pay attention to how you stand. That's what you say to people if they give you guff about being Mongo Foot. Well, the problem with Mongo Foot is you have to shift your feet a little bit once both are back on the board. Right. And uh, I guess you can't, like, bust a move immediately with a trick. <laughs> right. Uh which matters if you're like competing for half a million dollars, but sure. not if you're like on your way down to the Seven Eleven. Yeah, if you've never skated before and you want to try it, um, I would advise to not start with Mongo Foot at all if you don't know any better, mm. because you know you won't be made fun of. Right. You know. Maybe is that what kept you back? Maybe you'd be like so. pro right now. <laughs> that was what it was. Uh, but I've never seen this before. No, it makes sense. Though. If they, if you don't know which foot you're prominent with. Although I would say if you're right-footed, you're probably going to be uh, regular foot. And if you're goofy yeah. left-footed, you might be goofy foot. I think it has to do with handedness. Uh, so like if you're right-handed, your left foot's going to be forward. You're going to push with your right foot. If you're yeah. left-handed, you're going to be goofy foot. Where your right foot's forward, you push with your left foot. I think you push with your foot in the rear of the, do- the dominant hand side. Or foot side. Right. Yeah. But I, I think your dominant hand is typically your dominant foot as well. Yeah, it seems right. Yeah. And then if 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 you if somebody came up and pushed you? Yeah, that's the test. The the foot you put back to steady yourself, that's the one you want to use to push with. Before you crow hop and punch him in the face. <laughs> right. <laughs> what what the h man? Yeah, so I'd never heard that. That's a little trick you can do. Yeah. And I guess you're not maybe surprise somebody cuz if you think about it too much. <laughs> right. Like, all right, push me. Then you try to put both feet back at <laughs> yeah. once and you end up just hopping. Uh so there are a few different, quite a few different things you can do. Back in the day, it was all about like the downhill slalom, which is boring. Nah, I mean, super S- speed sorry. is not boring. It's scary. <laughs> it is a little That's scary. Probably what I said I I suffered a, a pretty decent head injury once. Really? Yeah, I got the wobble wheel going downhill, and I was like, I gotta bail out. And right before I went to go jump on the grass, the board went whoop. Yeah. And I went forward and landed on my head and skidded on my head entirely no no helmet at all right no yeah it's like 1990 right and uh yeah it was it was something yeah i remember i have not been the same since most neighborhoods have one hill you know that you don't dare go down and uh my best friend his name was chuck actually uh, at the time in (laughs) mid-high school (laughs) must have been very confusing (laughs) no he had a hill like that and i remember standing at the top of it and thinking there's no way I should be doing this yeah. and getting on the skateboard and trying to go down. And like you said, bailing out into the grass was always, uh, if you're in a neighborhood, a nice way to go about things. Mm-hmm. Is that what you did? Uh, I think I went all the way down. Nice. Actually. But it, yeah, it's a little scary, you know? <laughs> yeah, it is. There's no way I do that now. Yeah. I remember a car was driving past and stopped and went, oh my God, are you okay? <laughs> I was like, wow, is that bad, huh? And they finished their beer and drove on. Right. Threw their can at me. Uh, so you also have freestyle, which is um, doing tricks and things on a flat surface. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to get into the tricks a little bit in a minute. Which, if you are like, uh, what's freestyle? It sounds st- stupid. G- look up Rodney Mullen or Per Wellender yeah. on uh, YouTube. Check out some of their, especially their 80s stuff, the early, mid-80s. Yeah. They were doing some pretty cool stuff. And some of it is like that stuff that you were saying, the California dudes doing like handstands on right. a moving skateboard. Or just the 360s like 
standing in one place right. with their nose in the air. But then they would take their hands and like flip their board 360 degrees eight times and land right. on it. They were pretty good. Yeah. Pretty great stuff. And well, it, it takes gave creativity, rise, you know. For sure. It's definitely like uh, choreography in a skateboard. Yeah. Uh, well, and I have a feeling you're about to say vert skating. I wasn't, but I will. Are you ready? It didn't give rise to vert skating? Is vert that what you're skating. Say? Well, uh, vert skating, yeah, I, I, it kind of, that came out of those Dogtown guys. Yeah, in the swimming pools. Yeah, because a pool is considered vert skating. Vert is short for vertical, right, because you're skating on vertical surfaces like yeah. a pool or a bowl or a half pipe or a quarter pipe or whatever. Right. Or if you're like me, two milk crates and a piece of plywood. <laughs> Did you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Josh pipe. It was not that stable. <laughs> Uh, so vertical is when people started leaving and catching air, leaving the side of whatever surface they were on. Yeah. Which was really exciting at the time. Yeah, I can't imagine having been there. And, and it's only Tony gone Alva. up and up since then, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then you got street skating, which, um, is if you've seen, uh, ladies and dudes on the street, like, uh, jumping up the air onto a park bench and grinding that park bench or a railing. Right. Or smashing themselves trying to grind a railing. Yeah. That is uh, street skating. Or if you've ever played the Tony Hawk video game. Did you ever play that? Yeah. The first one. Yeah. If you play that enough, people who've played that enough know what I'm talking about. You start walking around in life and everything you see, you <laughs> right. think, oh man, I could grind that right. so hard yeah. if I could really skate. Yeah. Not in real life. No. Um, but yeah, so, so street skating kind of... I guess you could say it combines freestyle with obstacles, using obstacles in the um, built environment. That's street skating. Yeah, and that's the stuff that usually you'll see like uh, frowned upon by businesses and people thinking like these hooligans are out there. Right, which skateboarding is not a crime, man. Nope. Although if you use a skate, go to jail. <laughs> uh, but uh, to combat all that crime stuff... A lot of cities built skate parks in the 70s. Yeah. What they didn't realize is that um, when those kids fell and cracked their heads, their parents were going to sue. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, the insurance premiums for skate parks went through the roof, and all the cities shut them down. Yeah. And they went away for a very long time. And then I guess there were some changes in, in liability laws that allowed skate parks to come back. And so now skate parks are back. Yeah. But they're very frequently put up by cities that are like, hey, we'll build a skate park. And they don't ask the skaters how to build a skate park. So they yeah. build like a, a terrible skate park and the skaters don't use it. And the cities are like, you skate punk kids, <laughs> right. use the skate park. And they're like, your skate park sucks. And they're like, no, it doesn't. And yes, it does. And they skate away. Um, or they do it well and yeah. it's too crowded. Well, if there's one thing I know is that for every skate park in any city, there will be a group of skaters saying this place sucks. Sure. I remember when we shot at a skate park, remember? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there were these local kids, and yeah. it was a new skate park. One of them, that one kid was pretty good. Yeah, he was all right. Yeah. But um, I asked him, I was like, guys, this is great, right? This is new, and it's in Decatur, and like, they were like, oh, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Well, then that one kid lied. He said he, he lived from like a seedier part of Atlanta and yeah. hit us up for bus fare. He's a total poser. And some, yeah, one of the crew saw him like go into his house like a block away in this right. very nice neighborhood <laughs> of Decatur. And hide his skateboard in his backyard. <laughs> um, if you, and they, they can be different. They can be like uh, smaller half pipes and ramps and rails and things and obstacles to, uh, my recommendation, if you ever visit L.A., is to go to Venice Beach to their newish uh, skate park there. Uh -huh. And it is like the cement bowl. It's like a huge series of connected swimming pools. Yeah. And this is where you'll see some like – you'll see the old school guys that aren't leaving the bowl that are just like carving it up as like sweet as pudding. <laughs> and uh, then you've got guys that will really know what they're doing. Yeah. Like catching air and doing, you know – 360s and and there's a bulldog that rides a uh, skateboard there too uh, i've heard of that you should see him it's quite amazing <laughs> i'm sure it is like he can't catch air or whatever but just the fact that a dog is using a skateboard is pretty awesome so should we talk about some tricks let's well almost every trick on earth is based on the ollie the trick named after Alan Ollie Gelfand, he invented it in uh, the early 1970s, mid-1970s. And that is basically 
when you jump up in the air, and if you've seen skateboarders do it, you might wonder how on earth do they jump up in the air and have that skateboard seemingly attached to their feet. Mm-hmm. I never was very good at it. Oh, really? No. I, I could ollie pretty good. I was more of a sidewalk surfer than oh, like gotcha. a trick aerial guy. Yeah. You know? Well, I wasn't a trick aerial guy either, but I could ollie, you know? Well, explain the ollie. Oh, well, okay. So the ollie is, let's say you're on your board and you're on a flat surface. You kick your the tail of the skateboard down really hard against the ground. Yeah. And uh, what this does is this um, exerted force allows you to overcome the force of gravity. Mm-hmm. And since you're jumping at the same time, you jump into the air, Yeah. Um, you're taking off your own downward pressure on the board. So the front of the board, the nose, goes up high in the air. Yeah. And the fact that you've slapped the tail against the ground means the tail comes up into the air until it's even with the nose. Yeah. And the board's flat in the air. And it looks like it's attached to your feet if you do it right. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you and the board are four feet into the air, and then you come back down and you land it. Well, That's an ollie. It's funny you mentioned four feet. The world record, Danny Wainwright of, uh, I think he's from England, uh, <clears throat> recorded a 44 and a half inch ollie. Wow. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but was that like standing still? No, you know, you, it's like, you know, they just set up something to jump over. Oh, gotcha. And yeah. keep adding layers until, you know, you can't jump any higher. Yeah. And then you've got like, you know, 10 feet to, to get going and then just pop up and it looks like it's attached to his feet. And it, I, the ollie is so integral to so many other um, so many other tricks yeah. that it's, it's almost not a trick any longer in and of itself. It's like the basic mechanic of whatever other trick that follows. Right. But, like, you pretty much can't do anything without ollieing. And that's how yeah. those those guys originally caught air on vert skating was to ollie off of the coping, the top. Yeah. And then you would catch some serious air because you already had that extra momentum behind you as well. Okay, we're back, Chuck. We're going to talk about the names of tricks, different types of tricks. Yeah. All right, so if you've ever watched the X Games mm-hmm. and you hear the uh, sort of annoying announcers, <laughs> yeah. admittedly, talk, using all these words you've never heard, we're going to explain what some of these words mean just to help you follow along a little bit. That's right. Um, you might hear, we got front side air right? <laughs> or whatever. Front side is when you're facing the obstacle. And performing a trick, as opposed to backside, when your back is to the obstacle. Yeah, like you're basically going backwards on the skateboard. That's right. Yeah, um, a, let's say a 180 is a pretty basic trick, but it's, um, well, it's where you ollie and you and the board turn 180 degrees to face in the opposite direction. Yeah, like you go up the ramp, and then you turn in midair, and you come right back down. You can also do it on a flat surface, or you could 180 onto like a park bench or something and yeah, grind sure. it, whatever. Yeah. Um, but the 180 also kind of forms a basis for a lot of other tricks, especially vert tricks, like 360s and 540s, all the way up to 1080s. Yeah. And you can like grab the side of your board and just do all sorts of cool stuff. Yeah, Tony Hawk famously completed the first 900-degree turn, and... For many years, they thought that was it until a 12-year-old named Tom Shar in 2012 pulled off the first 1080, and uh, they filmed that it. it wasn't in competition. The first one in competition was a guy named Mitch Brusco. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did it at the X Games, and that is three full rotations in the air, uh, and obviously you have to land it su- successfully for it to count. And to live. And live. And uh, it's amazing, man. Three full rotations in the air. These dudes are getting up super, super high now. Yeah. Uh, you ever heard the word fakey? I have. A fakey is um, basically where you remain in your regular stance, but you're going backwards. Yeah. So you're doing like um, you're going into a, uh, a backside trick. That's right. Uh, a pop shove it is when you do an ollie with the 180, but your body isn't moving. You're just... Uh, Popping up in the air and flipping the skateboard around underneath you. Right. And then landing on it. Yeah. Uh, and then we talked about grinding. Um, there's a couple of ways you can grind. A true grind is when you're on the actual axles. So you got to be going forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, or you can go sideways and grind on your board, and that's called a board slide. Yep. 
Or a rail slide. And then the kickflip, of course, is the one that you see people busting butt on. Which I've pulled off once. That's right. The famous Josh kickflip. And then, of course, Chuck, there's the uh, manual, which is another way to say a wheelie. Oh, uh, when you just, uh, I was good at those. Front side manual. Yeah. Back side manual. I could do like, I was not good. <laughs> I think that's becoming clear. <laughs> like I thought it was cool if I could do a little wheelie and do a little 180 turn on, right. the, on the ground. Yeah. No, I'm with you, man. I yeah. understand. I wasn't very good either. But, Chuck, I had years of enjoyment. Twice. Third wave and fourth wave. Yeah. Loved skateboarding. Love it. I Like, I just love skateboarding. I think everybody should go out and skateboard all the time. So you're never going to be one of those old men that's like, quit grinding my rail. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. If I had a nice rail out front, I'd be like... <laughs> <laughs> get the hell off of my rail. But I, I would still, I, it's not like I hate skateboarding in general. Yeah, but you I might chip never. in and help build a half pipe in your neighborhood. Maybe away from my, my really nice rail. Right. That's a good idea. <laughs> uh, if you do want to try skateboarding, obviously, these days, with the safety consciousness of people, you should get a helmet and some knee pads and elbow pads. And if you're smart, maybe some wrist guards. Uh, Although that might not be cool. Well, no, actually, like there's a that's another reason skate parks often go in use is because there's local ordinances that say you, you have, have to, to yeah. wear a helmet and pads, and of course skaters are like that sucks. Yeah, but the wrist uh, guards that's a common injury because you'll you'll often go to brace yourself with your mm-hmm. arms when you fall, and uh, they say to try and fall on your fleshy parts of your body, but <laughs> you're really kind of at the whim of where gravity takes you, I think, at that point. Well, you know, that was another reason I think I wasn't ever that good is because back when I was a kid, they were all fleshy parts. <laughs> it's hard to get air. We should have been safe. <laughs> I was. When you fell. I was. Uh, you got anything else? No, man, that's it. Uh, skateboarding. If you want to know more about it, you should type skateboarding into the word search bar at uh, HowStuffWorks.com. That's the first thing you should do. You should follow that up by watching skate videos and go and buy a skateboard and go skating. Yeah. You know? I want to get a longboard now. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that's the old man style. Yeah, just cruising. Yeah, get on a flat surface and use it as Carving a... Carving the concrete wave. A mode of transportation. Yeah. Are you going to learn to do handstands on it? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, let's see. Since I said handstands and then laugh, that means it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this, uh, Josh, what are you hiding? Oh. And I'm glad to get this email because I knew I wasn't crazy. So let's just get into this. You know what can I say? I don't even remember this most recent reference. All right. Well, let's just explain here what's going on. This is from uh, Ben. Ben says, uh, hey, guys, I've been living like a troglobitic troglodyte uh, for the past six years because I just discovered your amazing podcast a few weeks ago. Uh, as penance, I've been listening to uh, several per day and have since gone to over 100. So he's binging. Uh, he said, I just noticed something and, uh, uh, during the Ken Cat Scuba Dive episode. Not one of our best. <laughs> no. uh, on August 12, 2008, Josh goes into detail about he was a certified scuba diver and that the one time he was in open water, he not only got seasick but also got a slight case of the bends mm-hmm. due to surfacing too quickly. Then, uh, in 2013, in the Diving Bell episode, Chuck says, I thought I remembered many moons ago you mentioned something about getting the bends. And Josh quickly and confidently retorted, I've never had the bends. <laughs> so, I know this is almost five years later, but it begs the question, what are you trying to hide, Josh? You have answered some of the greatest long- long-lasting questions in history, uh, but this is one of the few times where you've simply added another mystery <laughs> into the pile of... Uh, the enigma and conspiracy that is our world. So, uh, have you ever had the bins? Uh, so, uh, in 1990, I was skating down a hill and I <laughs> fell and hit my head. Uh, yeah, I would call it a mild case of the bins. Okay, so you just don't remember denying you had the bins, right? Okay. All right. Well, there's your answer. Yeah. Well, I not only do I not remember denying having the bins, when I denied having the bins, I had forgotten that I'd had the bins before. I and again, this is a very mild case, but it sure, wasn't sure. just seasickness. It was directly related to having just spent <laughs> a half an hour underwater, you know? All right. So well, I would call that a case of the bends. I think that clears it up then. That is from Ben Helms uh, from Mount Shasta, California. And I'm sure Ben will be unsatisfied with your explanation of... Ben. I just forgot. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see. If you want to get in touch with Chuck and I, you can tweet to us at SYSK Podcast. You can uh, join us on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know. You can uh, see us on our YouTube channel. Uh, just look up Josh and Chuck on YouTube. Tons of fun there. Uh, and you can send us an email to Stuff Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.